to our message today, and if you're taking notes, uh, it's called Putting Out Fires, and uh, we're going to be talking about the classic story. We've been in the classics all summer long. We're talking about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yes, their names are cool, and no, you don't know how to spell them probably. We're talking about this story, and it's the story of the men who were thrown in the fiery furnace, and I was thinking this week about the times in my life when I've been really annoyed by this little chirping thing called a fire alarm. Went on vacation this summer with my family. We went to the lake, and we were in the lake house, and it was the last night. On the last night, you got to clean everything, and you got to do all your laundry and put it back in, and you got to get the house picked up and, and ready to go to leave. And it was about 1 a.m. We had hit the pillow, and, and everything was done, and everything's ready to go back home. And my kids are asleep in the, on the floor next to us, and at 1.30 in the morning, you hear this, meh, meh, meh. Only the new invention is it's not just one fire alarm. They're all now like Bluetooth connected to each other. So it's 10 times louder, 10 times more annoying, and 10 times more, I don't know how to solve this problem. It happened once, and I went and I took the fire alarm down, and I reconfigured it, and I put it back up, and it started going off again, and I fixed it again, and I put it back up, and no sooner had I hit my pillow, and I had the same story, you could tell it yourself, and it went off again. I want to tell you the response. My kids, they slept through the whole thing. Praise the Lord. But can I tell you what? The effects of that alarm had an impact on me the next day on my 12-hour drive home. Sometimes in life, fire alarms go off in our life. We have fires that seem to come maybe unexpectedly, and the alarm starts going off. And if you're anything like me, I just take them all down and put them on the table and let my family figure out what to do when they show up at the house the next time. In the middle of the night, they get their own surprise. And I I, I know that fire alarms can be annoying, but the problem is my response is when I don't know how to solve it, I often just disassemble it and deactivate it. The problem is, like the box in the attic, that sometimes from time to time we find ourselves the alarm gets louder. And if it's not that, there's actually the real effects of what we would call a fire, which would be a bad scenario. When my great-grandmother was 88 years old, I was a kid, and I remember her 88th birthday. I remember everybody came to the house, and we had a bonfire out back in the backyard, and we had prepared for the bonfire and gotten all the wood ready, and and great-grandma came, and she couldn't come down the steps, so we, we put a little seat up for her in the windows, and she could look out and watch her family all down by the fire, and I remember that night we had the bonfire, and we all came up when it was time for her to go. We all gave her a kiss on the cheek, all like 25 of us, and bye, Grandma, we love you, and we'll see you next time. And the next day, we got a phone call from 88-year-old Grandma saying, I thought I had hives until I realized I have poison oak all over my face. You see, there was poison oak in the fire, and we had all contracted it. Twelve people in the family for the next two weeks itching and scratching from the effects of poison oak and our great-grandmother, who we loved dearly, suffering from the impacts of the fire that we were exposed to. You see, sometimes we hear the alarms go off and we ignore them, but other times what we find is we find ourselves in the middle of the fire and the fire reveals exactly what's in it. And as we come in our lives and we struggle with challenges and battles and crisis in our life or different challenges along the way. The question I would ask this morning is, what is the fire in your life today revealing about what's on the inside of you? Because the thing about a fire is this, you don't get to make up your mind in the middle of it. You see, often what happens is the fire just exposes and reveals what's already been put in place. Even the things like the poison oak that we could not see with our eyes, what we find is in the middle of the fire, it draws something out of it. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and it says this. It says that the fire reveals. It says in verse 13, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. The passage goes on to say that's why it matters all the more what the foundation of your life is. When the foundation of your life is Jesus, everything around you can burn, but the foundation stands. That's why when a fire hits wood, we know it burns it and there's nothing left. But there is some substance 
that remains and the things that remain are strong. They're confident. They're sure. They're able to stand the effects of the fire. When we talk about these men this morning, I want to I wanna relate it to the fires that we face in our lives. The tragic events, the unexpected circumstances, the trying situations, the chaos, the, the, the stress, the discomfort. And what we find is those fires often reveal something on the inside of us. But the, the conviction that I had on my heart this morning that I want you to take as we read this story is this. I don't want to be the guy. I don't want to be the church that waits for the fire alarm to go off until I know what's on the inside. I don't, I don't want to be the church or the kind of people that wait until we feel the effects of the smoke in our life to make the decision about what's going to come out of me when it does. Because if you hear the encouraging words of Jesus, you know that in this world you will in fact have trouble. And he says, but in the midst of that trouble, take heart, because I've already overcome the world. What is he saying? He's telling the same story through the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego hundreds of years prior to say this. It doesn't matter the contents of the fire, of what's happening, the pressure of the fire. It doesn't matter how high the heat gets turned up in your life when you have a foundation that's secure. You'll stand in the middle of it. When you have a foundation that's secure, you're no longer going to be annoyed by the chirping and the beeping of the fire alarm going off because you know exactly where you stand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were the people of God and, and, um, and God had, had given them a command and the command was worship no other God before me. In fact, that's one of the Ten Commandments and uh, if you don't know it, this is a good one to know. No other idols, no other God before me. And the people of God end up in a place in a land that was not their own under the rule of a king that was not their own. His name was King Nebuchadnezzar, all right? You ever read the Bible and wonder how to pronounce names and just hope you do it right? Just say it fast, no one will know. King Nebuchadnezzar had gotten a dream. And in this dream and in this vision, he had a dream of this tall golden statue. And the head was gold, and then there was silver and bronze, much like the Olympics, right? The gold is at the top and the best. He's wondering what this dream is all about, and he asks everyone, and no one knows, and he calls a man named Daniel. We talked about him a couple of weeks ago. And Daniel steps on the scene and interprets the dream for him and says, Nebuchadnezzar, you got to know something. The gold head of that statue is you. Nebuchadnezzar, you ever told your kids something? You ever said to your kids, I love you. You're the best kid in the whole world. I just love you. But go clean your room, right? And then you find your kid and you're like, why did you not clean your room? And they're walking around, I'm, I, my mom loves me. I'm the best. And you're like, you didn't hear what I was saying. What I was saying was, go clean your room. Nebuchadnezzar hears that you're going to be the gold head, the top of the statue and the image, and he begins to get excited. So excited that he forgets to listen to the rest of it. Because what God was telling him was, hey, King Nebuchadnezzar, you may be the greatest kingdom of all the kingdoms there are. Babylon may be at the top, but guess what? All the kingdoms, Daniel says in the interpretation of the dream, all the kingdoms of this world will fall, including you. Nebuchadnezzar got so attracted to the idea, his pride got the best of him, and he rose to the top, and he made the decision, <laughs> I'm going to make a golden statue and image. Pride filled his heart, he got excited, he created it, and he forgot the message. The message was, every kingdom is going to fall except for one. And I hear the start of the story, and I wonder how many fires we could put out in our life if we would listen to the whole counsel of God in our life. See, Nebuchadnezzar missed the idea that his kingdom would be destroyed, but that there was a kingdom that would last forever. And I think of this, and I think it's an encouragement, a prophetic word to us today. How many of you know the kingdoms of this world are not going to last? Like, I love my country. I'm grateful for my country. I'm grateful for our freedom. But can I tell you, there is not a country, there is not a kingdom that's going to last forever except for one. 
It, it means that any kingdoms that I build in my own life, my financial status, my well-being in this world, they, they may help me be successful, they may bless me, they may profit me in my life, and they're not bad. But can I tell you something? They will not stand for forever. And they miss the side of this message, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar builds a golden statue and tells everybody, I want you to bow down before this statue. You see, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had resolved in their heart and made up their mind they would bow before no other God except for God alone. So when they came out to get them, they came to get, King, uh, to, to get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they refused to bow before the idols of this world, and they threatened them. They said, hey, we're going to put you in the fiery furnace. If you don't bow, you will die. And they had a, a decision to make that when the pressure of the fire got turned up, how are they going to respond? You see, it's one thing in our lives for us to think about how we might respond if something got hard. It's another to be in the moment when the pressure is applied to know that what's coming out of me is gonna be good. What's coming out of me is gonna be pure. What at, what's coming out of me is gonna be holy. And they had to make up their minds before they ever found themselves in the fire. Daniel chapter three, verse 15. King Nebuchadnezzar says, if you do not worship, They've refused to bow, and he's giving them another chance. If you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Nebuchadnezzar, the golden head at the top, understanding his power, what he thought was unmatched. No one is as great as I am. And no one is as powerful as me. So when I'm threatening to put you in the fire, how in the world are you ever going to make it out? Is there anyone who can deliver you? Is there anyone who can save you? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. There's a confidence in their spirit. They know what they're going to get in the fire. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that no matter what, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, how do you think that made the king feel? He turned the fire up seven times hotter. What's it saying? It says, it's, what it's saying is he turned it as hot as it would possibly go. See, what happens when pride gets the best of you is rage comes easily. And he turned the fire up hot, and he told his soldiers to take them into the fire. And as the soldiers are going up to the fire to throw them in, the soldiers burned up. It was so hot. Verse 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. They bound up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're like, why would you have to tie them up? They're going into the fire. Like, they're going to die anyway. Well, they tied them up so that they wouldn't drag the king's soldiers into the fire with them. I don't know about you, but if somebody's throwing them in, you're coming with me. And they're bound up, and they're tied up, and they're thrown in the fire. What it says here in verse 24 and 25, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose up in haste. He declared to the counselors, did we not cast three men into the fire? Let's rehearse the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you can't count, it's three. Nebuchadnezzar is looking to the fire and he sees four. And they answered and they said to the king, true, O king. Nebuchadnezzar says, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. In other words, uh, a pagan king is looking into the fire where he threw three and finds four and says there's something different about the fourth. And not to mention, you know the guys we just bound up? Why are they unbound? How, how, how does that even happening and King Nebuchadnezzar is watching this and the men come out of the fire. He pulls them out of the fire and it says that there was no harm done to them. There was not even the smell, the effects of fire on them. The fire had no power over them. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king, my command. And they yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any other god except their own god. And in other words, the words we just sang in these last songs that was completely unplanned, 
that we bow before the Lord alone. And what does he do? He takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it around. And they come out of the fire and Nebuchadnezzar is looking at them in their life saying, how is this even possible? Except there must be a God that you serve who is far greater than me. And the world is watching what is happening to you in the fire. It's how you can go about your life and have struggles and challenges and hard days and emotional days. And people can look at you and say, but there's just something different about you. And what we realize is that Jesus stepped into the fire with these men and he delivered them out of something that was considered impossible. He pulled them out of a fire that was the hottest of fires as his way of saying, watch how I can deliver you in your life when you do one thing, when you bow before me alone. When I was in high school, we had a bonfire. I'm all about the bonfires today, right? It just, we had a bonfire. My dad, I, I'm going to be uh, completely transparent with you. I've, I remember one time in my life where I remember my dad losing his cool and yelling. One time. And uh, dad, if you're watching, that's shout out to you. I love you. I remember one time we had a bonfire. We invited a bunch of teenagers out, and it was on a piece of property up on top of a hill, and, and uh, the bonfire was going on, and some of the teenage boys showed up with a bundle of fireworks. And I remember them asking my dad, hey, we're going to light some fireworks. And he said, oh, no, you're not. And I remember that he told them they were not going to be lighting these fireworks. And, uh, you know, about 15 seconds later, we hear a boom in the middle of the fire. You know, one of those big bonfires that, you know, probably a little too big and Probably shouldn't be doing it. And I'll never forget my dad saying, oh, da, da, you know, like the dad can't, you know, you got the dad vibe and you coming out. It just comes out. You didn't have to ask the Lord how to do that. You didn't have to be trained how to do it. It just comes out of you. And I remember watching like, whoa, dad, I didn't know you had it in you. And I remember him. Here's what he did. He went to all the guys and he started asking questions. In the middle of the explosion, in the middle of the quote unquote crisis, he stopped in the midst of his rage and started asking questions. And I remember it because what actually ended up happening is it wasn't in fact a firework, it was a can of soda that had been shaken up and thrown into the fire and exploded. But his rage went cool after he asked the questions. This morning I want to do something for you. I'm not going to teach you. I'm not going to give you points to take home and do. I'm not going to tell you something you've never heard. I'm going to ask you questions the way my dad asks questions. I'm going to ask you questions because it's actually the questions in the middle of the fire that you're going through that are way better than, remember that phrase, that phrase you remember your mama or your grandmama said all the time, and it comes to you in the middle of your fire, you're like, I know, I should have known better. She always told me, don't do that. And here, I, right? Like, you know how sometimes that's not very helpful? You know how sometimes your spouse looks at you and says, I told you so. It's not very helpful. Can I tell you one of the most helpful things to my faith has been asking questions in the middle of the fire? I want to give you three questions today that I think are questions you can take a personal inventory of your own life when you're in the middle of the fire asking, how am I going to make it out of this? How am I going to extinguish this fire? What am I going to do to get to the bottom of it? Because can I tell you that day, my dad got to the bottom of the cause, but it's not what everybody thought it was. And sometimes in our life, we think we know about our problems and we think we know our struggles all too well and we think we know the answers and we've heard these classic stories since a childhood or, you know, we got it on repeat or we go to church every week and we forget to ask the tough questions in our life. Question number one this morning from this story is this, what are you bowing to? What are you bowing to? And, and I know it's 2024, and I know we live in America. And, and if you go to some countries today, actually, especially like in remote villages, like in Africa, you're going to find they still worship idols, like carved idols and carved images. And in our culture today, I think the greatest challenge to this text is we can be like, well, we don't have any idols today. <laughs> yeah, right. In fact, I think we might live in a country that has some of the biggest idols. Like King Nebuchadnezzar with the golden head on the top, I think we can live up there quite a bit. The idol of money, the idol of success, the idol of appearance or status, the idol of relationships, the idol of sex or pornography or social media, or for crying out loud, sometimes my hobbies become my idols. We live in a world 
full of idols. The question is not whether or not they exist. The question that's going to get you out of the fire is which one are you bowing to? And, and you've got to understand the thing about idols is the pressure of idols is very real. Right? Put yourself in their shoes. The king came to them. There's the pressure of authority in our lives. The king came to him with his authority and said, you're going to do this because I said so. Sometimes we start worshiping idols in our life because of the authorities in our life who have pushed an agenda or pushed an idol on us. And the pressure gets so real in our life. And we wake up 20 years later and we say, why am I still doing this? It's because somewhere along the way, somebody said to do it. And it didn't work. But I kept doing it. Sometimes it's the pressure of conformity. One of the verses in, in, in uh, chapter 3, verse 7, it says this, that after King Nebuchadnezzar issued the decree, it says all the peoples bowed down before him. They didn't even wait. They didn't say, I'll think about it. They didn't say, you know, I don't know if that's a good idea. Let, let me consult with my peers. No, the scripture says they all fell down and bowed down before the king. Why? Because everyone else was doing it. How many times have we heard that as we talk about idols in our culture? I mean, culture will say, why is this okay? Because everyone else is doing it. The pressure of conformity is huge in the world that we live in. If everyone else is doing it, then maybe I should do it too. They had the pressure of intimidation. The king came to them and gave them another chance and said, do it or die. Like, get on board or, or you're done. And sometimes when I think about these pressures in our lives, I realize most of us, didn't set out trying to worship other idols. Like, it's not the intention of our heart. So what do you do when you find yourself in the midst of a fire and you're in the midst of a fire because there's an idol in your life? Here's, here's what I've realized. There's two paradigms. Paradigm number one is this. I form my devotions and my affections and the things I bow to in my life based off the pressures that I'm facing. In other words, the pressures lead to my devotions. How, how are idols formed? We experience these pressures to cave and to give in and to bow before something other than the Lord. And because of the pressures, we create devotions to things that were never intended to have the devotion and affection of our heart. Listen, this isn't a you did bad or you did wrong. This is just a simply we're human. In the drift, it happens. And so we have to stop and take an inventory. It's not pressures over devotion. It's devotion over pressures. What does that mean? The right paradigm says this. The right paradigm says exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. God told me to worship no other idol, to bow before no other God than him. What are they doing? They're saying the devotion of our life is to bow before none other than God alone. And because of that, as they faced pressure, their devotion informed their pressures instead of the other way around. So I want to challenge you to ask this question in your life. Am I allowing the pressures of my life to inform my devotions? How does that happen? My schedule determines whether or not I go to church. That's a pressure-informed devotion. The people I hang with determine or influence my moral convictions. That's a pressure-determining devotion. Life is hard right now. And because life is hard right now, I'm going to do things I wouldn't normally do. That is a pressure-informing devotion. But we can flip the script. That's exactly what they did. Listen to what they said. They said, we bow before none other than God alone. They flipped the script on the king, and they came out the other side. And I just wonder, in my life, and in your life, and in the life of our church, is there anything we're bowing down to that we got backwards? Is there anything we're bowing down to because of the pressures of the world that we live in? Question number two this morning is this. How well do you know God? How well do you know God? Again, these are questions for reflection. This is not me making a statement or an assertion over your life. This is reading a story. This is how you read the Bible. You read it and you begin to ask, what is this telling me about God? What is this telling me about myself? What is this telling me about my current circumstances in my life? And you begin to ask yourself the question, how well do I know God? Because listen, can I tell you, the level at which you know God 
determines how you stand in the fires of life. It's a little bit like this. King Nebuchadnezzar looked at them thinking there is no other God higher than him. And he looked at them and he said, who's going to deliver you? And you want to know their response? They didn't say God. What did they say? They said, our God. In other words, it was personal to them. They knew their God could deliver them. Which means when the pressure of the fire was applied, they didn't give way. They didn't get weak. They didn't clam up. They didn't say, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm going to make You know what they said? We know who our God is. Our God is a deliverer. And because they knew who their God was, it changed how they acted in the fire of their life. Hey, sometimes I get it. There are fires that pop up on your Monday that you were least expecting. I wasn't expecting to get that phone call. I wasn't expecting for those people to do that to me. I wasn't expecting for my kids' week to go this way. I wasn't expecting for our finances to look like this. I wasn't expecting to lose my job, or I wasn't expecting to have a problem at work. Fires pop up. But when you know who your God is, it causes you to talk more about who he is than the fire you're standing in. And so sometimes I get caught up in this tension and torn in life of like, why am I always talking about the problem? And every time I find myself talking about the problem, and I, I'm being honest, I talk about the problem more than I wish that I did. Because when the fire gets hot, it's kind of hard to ignore. And when the effects of the fire, the smell of smoke, the burning hits in, it's hard to ignore. But anytime I find myself talking the problem of the fire, I realize it's because somewhere in here, I stopped acknowledging God for who he was. You know the Old Testament lists names of God. I'm not going to tell you all the Hebrew names, but I'm, I'm going to tell you this. God has multiple names, and his names have meaning. Like, for example, there's a name in the Bible that says, Jesus, God, is my healer. There's a name in the Bible that says, God is with me. There's a name in the Bible that says, God is my banner, like he's over me, he protects me. You, you know what Jesus means? Jesus means he's my deliverer. The Lord is a deliverer. Can I tell, just learning the names of God in your life, knowing who God is, is going to change your present circumstances because you realize, I know a God who can deliver me out of the fire. The fire's not that big a deal. Everybody else look and saying, what in the world are you thinking? Have you lost your mind at the Ark Church in Magnolia? But did, did the ghost smell get to you over here? Like, what happened to you back there? You say, no, 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 no. I just learned who God is. And can I tell you just real quick, it's never too late to get to know who God is. You know, in a marriage... You may get years down the road and realize you have some fires. And the fires often set in because we stopped pursuing the one that we love. And the fires set in, we weren't expecting it. Nobody stands, I've done a lot of weddings in my life and I mean, one for me personally, but like I've married a lot of people. <laughs> Oops. And I'm standing before people. Can I tell you the intention of their heart? is never that this thing wouldn't make it. The intention of their heart is I don't have it all figured out, but I'm going with this person. And when we are in the fires of life, what we realize is it's never too late to get to know the one that we love. And in a marriage, what we happen and see, even in like classes like Reengage, we're getting ready to start, is people who thought they were out of love realize that they just lost sight of the one they love. And when they come back together, it creates something altogether totally different. And the last 40 years of their marriage could be better than the first 10. Same way with God. He says, you can know me. I'm not just a God that's out there that created the world and lobbed it out there and said, good luck, y'all. Hope you make it. He's a God who can be known. That's what separates Christianity from every other religion on the face of the planet. Our God can be known, and when you know who he is, it changes your fire. The last one this morning is this. Have you ever let Jesus untie you in the middle of the fire? These men are standing in the fire, and Jesus shows up. 
theologians speculate that it's Jesus. They call it a Christophany. In other words, it's an appearance of Jesus. Well, if you know anything uh, about the New Testament, is it hasn't yet happened yet that Jesus has come to earth. In other words, we haven't seen him yet, and yet we find these times in the Old Testament where there is an appearance of Jesus coming into his creation to do things that the world is like, wow. So many theologians believe it was Jesus in the fire untying him which is how a king could look at that and say, that's got to be a son of God. Like, there's something different about that guy. Now, what I love about it is it says that Jesus was unbound. Well, the men that got thrown in the fire, they were bound up. Well, but when Jesus showed up, they become unbound. Why? Because one day he would come to earth in full appearance for a whole watching world to watch him be bound so that the unbinding of your life could last forever in his kingdom. And you have to know this. Jesus never promised that you wouldn't go through the fire. That's not what he said. Here's what he promised. He promised he would be with you in the middle of it. And when you know that, can I tell you what it does? It breaks the areas where you feel bound I'm talking about the idols that captured you when you were a teenager. I'm talking about the thoughts that, that plague your mind every day and make you feel captive. And although people look at you and think he's free on the outside, on the inside, you're saying, man, I am locked up in here and I don't know how I'm going to get out. What I love about this story is that in the middle of the fire, I mean, at that point, did the untying of the hands really even matter? They're alive. But Jesus says, watch this. And he has a heart of compassion and mercy and love that he unties them in the middle of the fire that they're experiencing. One of the greatest parts about starting a church has been watching people's lives become unbound. In fact, just this week, somebody came in with a gift of cookies. You know, we like cookies. We like steaks, you know. I'm sorry, I'm off point. Jazz likes steaks. Yeah. And he came in and said, for a month I've been coming to this church. In the first two weeks, I sat in the back row and I cried the whole time. And he said this. He said, I'm ready to make church a thing in my life. Can I tell you something? I've heard testimonies like this all the time. I don't know his story, but I know this. Jesus is untying him in the middle of the fire that he's in. See, my daughter, Emmy, around Christmas time, had her very first ever musical production at school. And she came home real nervous and she said, Dad, I'm nervous. And I said, why? And she says, I don't know how to bow. And I said, honey, I'll teach you. And so over and over in the living room, we practiced bowing over and over. Sometimes I think we were taught how to bow as a kid and we think that's what it means to bow before Jesus. No, at a musical production in school, you stood up and you bowed before a crowd like King Nebuchadnezzar asked people to bow before him as a way of giving credit and glory to you. Listen, there's something different about bowing before Jesus. And when you understand this, it humbles you and it changes you. Can I tell you, my daughter got to the musical program and she didn't bow. I was like, come on, we practiced it. You can practice it, but if you never do it, it won't change you. I, uh, was worshiping on a Sunday morning here earlier in the start of the church. And I felt like the Lord was like, I need you to bow. And I said, Lord, you know I'm sitting on the front row, right? And I felt like he was like, yeah, see, there's lots of extra space. Go right ahead. <laughs> you know what I did? I sat in my seat instead. And then we had another conversation. I said, if you won't bow, they won't bow. I was like, all right, I got to get over myself. When's the last time you got on your knees? You see, I used to think this. I used to think people in worship who raised their hands were kind of weird. I'm going to be honest. And then I did it. And it changed me. I used to grow up in, uh, I grew up in a church. We didn't bow much. But every time I bow, 
It doesn't just do something for him. It humbles me. It reminds me that I'm submitted. It reminds me that I can't get out of this fire by myself. Listen, I'm not preaching at you today with points. I'm asking you questions. When is the last time you bowed? And maybe for you today, you're like, wow, this is my first day of this church. They're kind of weird. I promise we don't do this every week. But maybe we should. Because what it does inside of here is it changes the perspective in my life of the fires that I'm standing in. And it humbles me to remind me that the only one worthy of my praise, the only one worthy of my knee hitting the floor is him. And it changes me. So maybe for you, when you go home tonight and there's no one home, maybe for the first time you get on your knees and ask the Lord to do something in you. Maybe the fire alarm that's been going off and it's annoying and you're beating it and you're changing the battery and nothing is working, maybe the only thing that will break through it is to be on your knees. Maybe the effects of the fire that you're feeling, the smell of smoke and the burning in your life, and it feels like the fire is raging and can't be put out. Maybe the only way you can put it out today is to acknowledge you've been bowing before other things and it's time to bow before him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, we worship you.